morning again. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, um, I'm missing a little thing right now. <laughs> and uh, but like you said, I, I challenged my granddaughter. And as you can see, I lost. Okay. So don't challenge people you don't know that they might win, you know. Anyway, uh, somehow this uh, title, I, and I and didn't, you know, really think about the title, The Godly and Faithful of some Cloud. It could go the other way, The Ungodly and Unfaithful of Psalm 12. And that's what I want to talk about. But before I do that, I need to kind of break the ice. Because I'm nervous because uh, you're looking at me like I'm a new guy. Okay? You, you're not so much interested in the message right now. But, but, and I want to take that away. Okay? Okay? People laugh because it's true. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a little funny story. Okay? I just... Just learned that from Robert, my son, who had come a couple of weeks ago. He was here, and he had a good time. And thank God that you know he did enjoy it. And we try to make everything possible for him. But he told me this joke, and I read it a couple of times, three or four times. And uh, my wife insisted I read it more, more and more. But you know, sometimes you have other things you got to do. But she's always right. I mean, she does. And I. I don't know, we get into a little bit of a frustration argument, but she's right. I like the way she had a certain part, and I asked her again for it. Anyway, story goes like this. There was an old woman. Well, not old, excuse me. There was a woman, okay? Whoops, already. <clears throat> there was a widow, I meant to say widow woman, okay, from an old Pentecostal church who didn't have any money, was poor, and didn't have anything to eat. So she got down on her knees, and she prayed. She says, Lord, fill my pantry. I have nothing to eat. So one day, she opens the front door, and wow, there's a big box full of groceries. I mean, it was chock full. And she immediately... He praised the Lord. He did it. He did it. He did it. Wow, oh, he was praying the Lord. About this time, here comes this guy, rushes out of the bushes, right? And he says, Woman, that wasn't God that brought those things. I'm your neighbor. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in your God. I bought him. I went to the grocery stores. I paid it with my own money. I bossed them and I put them in your front door. And I left them there. And, and I rushed back and hid so that I could hear you praise, give praises to the wrong God. And she's not listening. You know, she says, He did it. He did it. He did it. She says, Woman, you're not listening to me. I'm the one that brought him. I'm the one that bought him with my money. I'm the one that put him there. And I rushed out and hid in the bushes to see what you would do. You know, lady's not paying attention. He did it. He did it. And he made the devil pay for it. You know, the devil thinks he's got it. But the uh, Lord, he knows all the things. He knows all the things. Okay, I want to do something here a little different than I normally do. Is that I'm not going to use the New King James Version because I have been reading the NIV, the 84 version, a long time. And I memorized a lot of, ver a lot of Psalms with it. Okay, and I memorized... Psalm 12, and about a week and a half ago, me and Pastor were talking about being faithful, and I told him, you know what, that's what I'm going to write about, being faithful. He agreed, yeah, okay. So, normally, 
by the time I'm going to say something or I'm going to bring, I mean, I'm, I'm already on my sixth draft. I will only have four little paragraphs Monday, this past Monday, only have four little paragraphs on my notebook and my uh, phone. Wasn't too much. But because I had this memorized and I had it, I, I memorized it and I, don't, I meditated so many times, you know, the Lord gave me the word. Anyway, so I want you to turn to Psalms 12. I want to read it in the NIV, 84. That's before they neutered everything, okay? Okay. He says, there's, there's uh, eight verses. He says, Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. Everyone lies to his neighbor. Their flattering lips speak with deception. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and every boastful tongue that says, We triumph with our tongues. We own our lips. Who is our master? Because of the oppression of the weak and the groaning of the needy, I will not arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those that malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O oh Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. The wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. You know, this, this psalm took me and I took the time to memorize it along with others, but this one here is one of my favorites in the Psalms. Not because it says everything I wanted to say, but because it says a lot of things about what the really is going on in the world today. If, you know, when you look at, view the last verse, the wicked freely sprout about when what is vile is honored among men. We can all see that. We can't, we, nobody should doubt it. Says, you know, it might seem, and I'm talking about this, uh, the psalmist here, which is David. It says, it might seem that more than a mouthful to say that all the godly are no more, and that all the faithful have indeed vanished. I believe we have an exper- we have an experience to some extent how every day we're being bombarded with fake news. On social media, especially on our cellular phones, on TV, on radio, in popular magazines, in newspapers, and almost every other form or source of information network that we have. There's no shortage, absolutely no shortage of groups or individuals that are obsessed in pushing their agenda or and or propaganda to the masses. What makes it worse, and this is what makes it worse, is that if we don't accept it, or the, or the public doesn't accept it, you know, their agenda as true, they are quickly canceled to the point where they are not allowed to speak or write about their own views. Have you noticed that? They call it the cancer call. There's no such thing as allowing for two sides of the story to be told anymore. Facts are irrelevant. It doesn't matter if you have a fact. They don't care. It's their way or no way at all. That's what matters. Today we simply, we don't know where to turn to. Or who to turn to. Or what to believe. Everyone seems to lie. To be lying to their neighbor. Again, the word everyone. I use it only because the psalm, the psalm is saying it. I don't mean that everyone, single one. But when we say everyone, it means a lot, a lot of people. That's what it means. 
in the media today, fair journalism has practically ceased to exist. It appears as if, as if everything coming out of these people, their mouth, their writing, is being thrown out as gospel truth. It appears, uh, or, or far from the truth, well, let's say far from the truth, you know, most of it is individual preference, pre, pre, uh, preferences as to what they believe or want to believe and what they want us to believe. See? So they believe it, they want to believe it, and they want us to believe it. Cal Thomas, a very popular syndicated columnist, this is his quote, when asked about what has America lost as a result of journalists losing their responsibility to be fair. He said, they have lost truth, which has been replaced almost exclusively by opinion from a circular progressive perspective. It is why trust in the media is near a record low. And that is true. I, well, just a while, I mean, well, I hear people often, I don't know, I don't know if I believe CNN, ABC, CBS, whatever, you know. You don't know. In fact, the public in general is becoming very vulnerable to this type of journalism. We think it is becoming like a normal thing. And even our own government, even our own government is becoming insensitive to this type and does little to protect the common people from this flood of false information, either because of the amount of it or simply because lack of concern. One of those two. And our business world is also taking advantage of this phenomenon. They have no qualms, and I hope you can identify with me. They have no qualms about making false statements about their products with the idea of seducing people into buying them. Through the use of modern technology, their jobs are made much, much, much easier. Have you ever served, okay, I'll give you an example. Have you ever served the net? I'm using the word serve. That's the first time I ever used it. I just turn it on and just put on, you know, internet. That's what I say. But serve, okay? Have you ever served the internet looking for some sort of remedy? For, let's say, a weight loss solution. Let's say you're looking for a skin blemish problem. A hair growth remedy. A spider vein remover. A miraculous pain reliever. A pots and pants tarnish cleaner. And the list goes on. It goes on. Okay. The, endless, the list is endless, really. It's, it's, I'm sure you all have expected ex- experiences to some extent, right? Okay, after clicking on an app, uh, one of those apps, you know, ad uh, websites, you'll see it, you'll be a little bit about it, say, ah, okay, so you turn it off. You click off of that, and you go on to something else of interest, right? Before you know it, you find yourself being bombarded by what? By that same type of advertising that you just saw. Wow. Hey, how does that happen? I used to ask myself, how does that happen? How did they know? Did they read my mind? Okay. Well, it's all made possible by collecting cookies, right? Cookies by the website. This is the original sole intention of cookies was to help the website remember information about your visit there, which would make it easier to visit the site again and make the site more useful. And above all, this information was not to be sold. That's what they said, not to be sold, right? Well, it's become quite common that this gathered information is sold because everyone lies to their neighbors. They said they're not going to do it. 
but they do. And so these third parties that get this information, they buy it, and now they're equipped for this information. They've actually got something to deal with, okay? And so they're, you know, they're in the business of producing, selling products. And they sell and produce products that people are most interested in. And how do they do it? Well, you got 10,000 hits by certain people that are looking for, let's say, a, a uh, what that one of the ones I just mentioned, a, you know, a vein remover, spider vein remover or something like that, or a hair growth, re, you know, restorer. Well, they get these thousands of them. And so they know this is something that people are looking at. So they're going to key on that. So now, these third parties, they're equipped, and now they hire themselves. This is what they do. They hire themselves a good writer who can write a very convincing argument. Okay? See if, if, if you agree, okay? Number two, they get hire themselves a so-called world-renowned doctor, okay? In other words, a previous unknown, okay? Who is willing, yeah, that's true, to back them up, you know, or back up the product, but for a profit, you see? There's always some doctor, renowned. You know, I've looked, I've checked on this stuff. I never heard him. I go to Google, they never heard of him. What the heck? How do you world renowned? That's a good title, though. World renowned. And then they hire themselves an advertising agency with expertise in how to promote the product they're going to sell. They, on whatever source of media that they find most effective. Well, the downside of all this is that it doesn't matter whether the product works as advertised or not. It really doesn't. Because since the government is no longer able to keep up with a vast number of false uh, advertisings, there's no such way, or there's no way to stop them. In the past, now some of you remember, in the past, false advertisements was ground used to sue companies. For what? For not for the product not doing what they claimed it to do. Without fear of being hit with a lawsuit, like a lawsuit, what do they do now? They don't care. Their priority is now to what? It's, uh, their priority now is to use, uh, is to uh, produce a product. Sorry, produce a product to sell a significant, significant quantity of it and to make a significant profit. And who cares about customer satisfaction? They don't care about that. And then some of the companies are the fly-by-night variety. You know, and if, if they'll tell you, hey, guaranteed, if you don't like it, just send it back in. Okay? And they give you a phone number. They give you a phone number. And then when you try to call it because you're dissatisfied, guess what? That number can't get through. It doesn't exist. You go to the internet and try to find out what, if they have a, 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 a website, they don't have one. And if they did one, it's off now because it's, it was a one-night thing. They made a lot of money. They, they sell a significant amount. Now, why am I saying this? Well, because I've been hit with one, you know, and uh, I got hit. Let me see if I'm not jumping too far ahead on this out here. Anyway, so this is what I'm saying after I, I haven't said that. Good luck, okay, good luck in requesting a refund of your hard-earned money in case you're a very dissatisfied customer with this type of thing. 
It's just that bad. So, if we start back, if we go back to the beginning, and I'm not, I'm not looking at it, but you, you know, you're right there on Psalm 12. That's what we're going to be. It's in Psalm 12, the Lord, uh, um, the psalmist, which is David, is calling for the Lord's help to cut off all these types of deceitful people. To cut them off. Their only interest is self-interest, and they're proud of it. Wow. They're proud of it. You know, we read of many who have become extremely rich through means that are not acceptable, at least in the sight of God. Are you, are you with me? They have become extremely filthy rich, they say, through means. You know, but how many of you are aware that even though God allows these people to accumulate this vast amount of money, it's not necessarily to their own interest. You know, I read one time when a lottery first took place in California, where I proved it, back in the 80s, I think it was the 80s, early 80s. Or, anyway, uh, there was this guy who won the lottery. At that time, he won $3 million. But at that time, $3 million was about as good as, let's say, $25 million today. He won the lottery, and he was so excited. He took a trip. He went to Mexico. He got killed. Okay. Whether he was throwing off his money, I don't know. But you know what? I don't think that's a blessing from God. You win the lottery, I'm blessed. You know, no. You're not blessed. In fact, this is what Proverbs 28, 8 says. He says, One who increases his possessions by earth, usury and extortion gathers it, gathers it for him who will pay the poor. Now, extortion, extor, uh, yeah, extortion, you know, that's through many means. I honestly don't believe that we should pay the lottery. That is not something God would want us to do. That's stealing. You say, how is that stealing? Well, there's a lot of people, about 90, over 90% of the people who, who pay the lottery are poor. And they use that money that they get that's supposed to go to their kids to buy stuff for them. Okay? They use it to buy lottery tickets. And, we, and, and if we put in, we're helping them Continue playing that game. I am not going to steal money from kids. Those people that do it all the time. That money is not hard earned. That's not that's not money that we work with our hands. That's eating. That's what I feel about lottery. Okay. <clears throat> that's extortion. And look what he says. Gathers it for him. For he who will pity the poor. That guy got killed in Mexico. He didn't enjoy his three million. I don't know how much he had spent, but whatever he left, hopefully it went to, like the Bible says, what, hopefully it went to someone who would pity the poor. You know, a good indicator to watch, at least I use it, is the wealth is from God, is to look how they make use of their money. How do they use it? Do they use it to, for a good cause? Do they feed the poor with it? Do they help uh, the less fortunate? Do they provide, you know, with medical and physical needs for them? You know, there's a lot of, you know, uh, gift donations you can make to the poor. You know, my wife likes to give to a lot of those, you know, I, I hate to see poor countries, African countries, that are drinking polluted water. Wow. And they say, hey, you know, send in and they can have free water for a month. And if you send a certain amount, that you can even buy them a well to keep the, the village for the lifetime. 
That's money well spent. Okay? Or do they use it to spread God's word around the globe? You know? God needs, I don't say, I, I hate to say needs money, but rather he wants people to have money so that they, he can get their trust on letting go of that money for his cost. Okay. Or do they use it? Now, that's three ways they can use it. Or do they use it to live a lavish lifestyle? To fare sumptuously every day? I got these words from the rich and poor man. You know, the rich guy that had everything. There was a beggar outside the gate. Not even the things that fell off the table would he offer him. He was living a lavish lifestyle. Very sumptuously every day. Or do they make, use it to make donations to have someone elected into office? This is what I heard you know, Into office who clearly rejects God's law and practices ungodly practices. Or maybe, excuse me. Do they use it for that? You know, I'm going to mention this guy because he does that all the time. George Soros. He's a billionaire who contributes, contributes billions now. A lot of money. Quite a sum of his wealth goes to finance and financially support politicians, former presidents, presidents today, who are very liberal, have a very liberal agenda. Very liberal agenda. You can see where we're heading right now under their leadership. And people who are right behind him, former presidents, who are probably giving him direction. I'm going to mention Hillary Clinton on this one. She's a politician. You know, heavily, heavily liberal. You know, he's also provided startup funding for the liberal think tank, where people get together and put all their mind. How are we going to get it so we can pass, so we can think of more liberal things to do? You know, I don't know. It's hard to keep up with the news, and I don't like. Someone said right now. You know, it's so hard. Every time you turn around, there's bad news. Nothing but bad news, because that's what they want you to hear. Bad news. It discourages you. But they want to discourage you. They want you to depend on them for everything. The power of such wealthy men like him, like Sorrel, seems almost impossible to stop. The actions oppress the weak, and cause great hurt, groaning to the needy. Verse 5. They're here. They're doing it now. But that's not the only person, people, the filthy rich. There's also, there's also others. There's others like the elite. What's the elite? They are a special group of selected people who think they have special qualities, ability. Those are the elite. There's the famous movie stars. Uh, I have movie stars and popular singers. I have also uh, MVP players, athletes, very popular. They influence the culture. Right now, the athlete, the professional sports, has had an awful influence in, in our country. They're influencing our young people, most of all. I can't get over this, but, uh, you know, they, they do a terrible job of influencing our kids. A terrible job.
Then comes the powerful. The powerful one comes up with this one. The President of the United States, for instance. His elected, his elected officials. Senators, House of Representatives, governors, mayors, they also are contributing to leading our country in that direction. And then comes CEOs of big cooperations or industries. World Bank CEOs, they control a lot of, they're part of the elite also, some of these people. Oil industries. Auto industry, pharmacy, technology, all these CEOs are very, very powerful individuals, very, very powerful, very influential in what's happening. Then we have the presidents of universities. Okay? These people, we don't know how subtle they are. They're that control, they influence all of our young people our next generation. A conservative person, young, uh, you know, young man, young woman, goes into college and out comes four years later a very liberal individual. Why? Because these people, presidents, are allowing that stuff and they encourage that. They also contribute to the way this country is going. Then we have the press which we just talked about right here, right? Uh, just a while ago here. The press, journalists whose job was to be fair and report the truth. They're no longer doing it. You can't trust them. I wish I could. Oh, there's some out there, you know, but you've got to know who they are. It's not, I'm not saying everybody. I'm just saying there's a lot of journalists who all they do is report false information. Some of them are actually ensnared. You know, if you're a journalist, put, them, put yourself in their place. Let's say you're a journalist. You're making big bucks. You bought a big home. You bought a big car. You're, you're used to that lifestyle. And then all of a sudden, you're threatened with losing your job. How are you going to pay for that? You're enslaved. You're ensnared. Okay? So the press, we have the elite, the famous, the powerful CEOs, President of the University, the press, and of course the filthy rich. All these are contributing to the direction that this country is going. It seems that for the most part, Elected officials, such as politicians, are no longer representing their constituents, but rather their own self-interest. I've noticed this lately that, you know, almost everybody that, and I'm not going to mention parties because they're all together in that, they're self-interest. They're making bucks. Big bucks. They're invested in the right things because they know the inside information. It used to be like, hey, you're not supposed to get inside information. But today, hey, everyone lies to their neighbor. And they get it. They probably, this is something that stays with us. Yeah, right. But, you know, in all of this, I know it seems like a sad sermon here. I mean, you know, Terrible sermon. I see the seriousness of you guys. When's he going to get to better news? Of, you know, you know. Thank goodness that God, that for God nothing is impossible. I talk, I talk about stopping these people. Thank goodness that for God nothing is impossible. You know, He can and He will. He will in His own time completely put a halt to their ungodly behavior. I love that. You know, and I, I wrote it down, but I have to back it up with scriptural. You know, it has to be scriptural. You don't take my opinion. I don't want to be up here giving you my opinion. I want to be out here backing it up with scripture. He says, He will keep us, the believers, safe and protect us from such people forever. 
That's verse 7. Okay? We can be sure of it because His words are flawless. That's verse 6. He will not allow evil to continue indefinitely. indefinitely. Just as He did not allow the very angels of heaven who rebelled against Him, but threw Him out of heaven. Revelation. You know, He threw Him out of heaven. He did not allow Adam and Eve to continue in the Garden of Eden where they had access to the tree of life and they could live forever after they sinned. But God wasn't going to allow that if they sinned forever. Threw them out. He didn't allow the pre diluvian world to continue in their wickedness. What did he do? He destroyed them with the worldwide flood. Except for knowing his wife, his three sons and wife. He destroyed them. Then let them continue in their wickedness. He did not allow Sodom and Gomorrah to continue because of their sexual immorality and destroy those cities with the rain with the rain of with the rain of brimstone and fire from heaven. You can read that in Genesis. He did not allow the Egyptian Pharaoh to continue to enslave his people forever, but made a way for the great Exodus. Exodus. Exodus 12. He did not allow King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian who thought himself unstoppable, to remain in his evilness. You know, what did you do? God made him lose his bearings, turned him into a beast like mine, and then he sent him out to brace in the open fields for seven years. Till he regained his senses and he realized that God is in control. He still is right now. He is in control. <clears throat> he did not allow Ananias and Sapphira to continue living after lying to the Holy Spirit. It set a great fear upon the early church. It was a great lesson for them. Especially in the early church, because, you know, when you start something, it becomes like, hey, everybody can do that. You want to put a great deal on them. But over time, it's being, you know, overlooked more and more. But at that time, he didn't allow them. It was the same will be with these men who exercise extreme power through the misuse of their wealth or their position. That's what God's going to do. No one can get away with it. God's going to deal with evilness for sure. That's biblical. You know the way that man, the way in which man is now regarding God's law. God's law. You know we regard God's law like if it doesn't exist, like it's not there. Hey, people are not paying attention to what the law of God is saying. You know. So the psalmist, when he wrote this, he was right on target. Psalms 119, 126. He says, It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they regarded your law as void. Yeah. They have regarded your law as void. They have treated it like if it wasn't there. And he says, it is time for you to act. It is time for you to ask the Lord. You know, he's not saying that. The psalmist is not saying it because he wants to scare people. He's saying it because God is telling him what to write down. You agree with me there? Yeah. You know, God brought a halt to the southern kingdom of Judah for their disobedience by sending them out to Babylon to serve the slaves for 70 years. The same thing went for the northern kingdom a hundred years earlier. He allowed, uh, God allowed them to be conquered and dispersed among the Assyrians. They never came back as a official nation, that part anyway. Why? Because they, they, they disregarded the law of God as if it never existed. What, goes good, what is good for them is good for us. Again, we can be sure that God will act because His Word is flawless. Flawless means it's perfect. There's no 
and charity in it. There's no, like, maybe he, maybe he doesn't got it, he didn't get it just right. Maybe he didn't mean that. No. You know, he does not lie. Let me show you. Numbers 23, 19. This is a little small. I, I know that it is. I know some of you might not be able to read it, so I'll read it. I like the NIV version, but I'll read both of them. It says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? I look at the NIV closely, but I like it kind of close with me a little better. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? No. You know, he, he does everything he says. That's why that's his word. We can stand on his word every day. We don't have to say, can we trust it? Uh, no. It's the word of God. Let's return back to the beginning of Psalm 12. Again, I'm just keeping you there. You just, you just kind of look at what it says. Here's the psalmist. Here the psalmist says, Help, Lord, for the godly are no more. The faithful have vanished from among men. That's verse 1, right? You know, here's what I'm saying about when it says all. Most likely, the psalmist which is David, again, meant that because he saw so few of them, or he saw so few of the godly, that it seemed like there was none left. And that's feasible, because Isaiah thought the same way. He thought that he was the only one now left. But it turned out there was about, what, I don't know, 5,000 or 7,000 hidden uh, prophets. But he thought he was the one left, because he didn't see anybody there. Well, the same thing, David saw probably very few of them. He thought, man, there's none there. That's why he said that the godly are no more. The people have vanished from our men. We know there's some, but to him it appeared like there's none. Okay? Faithfulness even today is indeed rare. Think about it. Faithfulness even today, is indeed rare. Most people find it very difficult to keep their word. I'm coming down to us here. You know, it's very hard for us to keep. They say one thing and do another. Being faithful means staying truthful and steadfast to what they have committed to. Okay. Matthew 5.37, I'm not putting it up there, but it says, Jesus was speaking here, it says, Let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than this comes from the evil one. We would like to think that all Christians would be faithful, but far from it. If one is truly committed to God, then there should be nothing short of a true emergency to keep one from fulfilling his word. Too many find it impossible to honor their word. Look, I'm up here. I lost the challenge, as you can see. Not only did I lose my 20-year-old facial hair, but I had to face the music. Okay? I lost the challenge, but I wasn't going to be unfaithful and tell my granddaughter I changed my mind. That's not a faithful man. You've got to stick to what you committed. And I'm glad I did it because he was very successful in high school. Got a scholarship, full scholarship to the Craig School of Ministry. I mean, School of Business at Fresno State. That was worth it. I mean, even if I had to embarrass myself even twice as much, just, just for that, it's worth it. But faithfulness is something we need to keep. If you give your word, my goodness, don't back up on it. A lot of people, they give 
somebody, you know, I'll give you, hey, I'll be there. And then somebody else invites them to a little better thing, and then they'll come to, you know, I couldn't make it. On the last day, you have no chance to try to make up. That is not being faithful. This is what the Bible says on unfaithful men. He says, confidence in an unfaithful man in time of trouble is like a bat tooth and a foot out of joint. Now, if you've got a bat tooth, <laughs> the only way to do it, get rid of that, is to take it out. You've got to pull it out because it's not going to hurt just right now today and then it's going to get healed up. There's a cavity inside that's causing that hurt. And that cavity is not going to heal by itself. The only thing, take that out. If you've got a foot out of joint, you can't walk forward, you can't walk backward, you're stuck. You're sitting down. Your whole life at a standstill. That's an unfaithful man. You can't count on him. If you have confidence in him, you're in trouble. That's why when I ask the person, I've asked people here, hey, can you help me with this? Pastor asked me to help them do this. Can you help me? If you can't, tell me no. Don't say, well, maybe. No, 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 no. Or I will and then don't. Tell me. I'd rather hear it now because then I can make, you know, I can make other provisions for that. Call somebody else. You tell me yes and I'm counting on you. The day comes and you can't help me. I didn't take the time to call anybody else because I was what? Counting on you. No. -uh. I'll be like that guy with the back tooth. And it pulled out a joint. Not only will I be sitting down painful, pain with pain. No no means to go to the doctor and get, you know, hey, I gotta go over to the doctor and have that tooth pulled out. No. Talking about honoring one word, okay? I had the experience of speaking to a uh, or uh, speaking to a man who was from Saudi Arabia. Okay. I asked him, hey, where are you from? Because he had an accent. And we and I liked the conversation. Hey, where are you from? He said, Saudi Arabia. Anyway, we were talking about honor. Okay. He told me that when two men in, the, in his country make an agreement, they finalize it with guess what? With the twisting of their mustache. I could have done it yesterday, but I can't do it today. Okay? I was going to do this, but I can't do it. But if they do this, that means it's a seal. It's their honor. They won't break it anymore. Because to break their honor in their society, it's, it's a badge of honor. To lose that, they lose all self-respect. They lose all kind of respect. They won't do it. So if you make an agreement with a Saudi Arabian and he does this, man, you better keep it. You better keep it. Okay? Well, what a far cry from what we experienced here in the good old U.S. of A. What a far cry. A country supposedly under God and whose constitution is based on the Holy Bible. Wow, what a contrast to Saudi Arabian guys who are quick to their mustache. It's good enough. They won't break it. Here, we need, when we make an agreement here, see if you disagree with me on this one. Because I'm just writing it when God is, well, what I think the Lord is putting in my mind. It might be false. Right? It's a, it requires a certified written agreement. Some of you, maybe a lawyer here, can agree with me here. You've got to have a signed, certified signed agreement, usually written in legalism. You know, when you can understand it, it takes a lawyer to, to understand it. But it has to be in triplicate form or more. It has to be signed by the agreeing parties and a few witnesses. And then it has to be notarized. It's got a lot of stuff. Right? Even then, there are cases where a very few uh, shrewd 
lawyers can twist the word to make it say something totally different from its original intent. They got lawyers that can do that. Trust me. They can change the wording. See, it did, I didn't mean that. Hey, I'm sorry. That, that's how we're going to take it. You know, the United States Constitution is under such attack, even as I speak, by food politicians and their lawyers to get it to favor their intended means. The First Amendment is being torn down word by word. It won't be long before we won't have, we will no longer have the freedom of speech or of the press or of the or assembly or the right to petition the government for a redress of grievance. In other words, hey, let's have a let's have a a, a, a gathering here and let's protest you won't, in a peaceful manner. You won't have that ability anymore because they're breaking that down. There's not going to be, for that matter, any freedom at all in this country. This is what John Adams, who recalls John Adams? Who, who, who's John Adams? Second President of the United States. Okay. Thomas Jefferson was the third. Okay. That's the only one I knew. I have to look this one up. Okay. John Adams, he said this, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Morally and virtual are the foundations of our republic and necessary for society to be free. Wow, I'm going to read the first sentence again. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. You know, we're getting immigrants. We don't know where we're getting them from. I don't mind immigration, but in a proper way. You know, I hate to say this, but we're in danger. People are coming over. They're not, hey, they're not fingerprinted. If they shoot you or kill you and get the fingerprints, so what? They, they don't have any record of it. It's dangerous. Okay? You know, it worries me. One person put it this way. I'm going to put it a little bit milder. Okay? He says, immigrants, newly arrived in, 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 immigrants, they should be quiet. They should listen. They should learn. You know why? Because they're coming from a country they didn't have a free society. They don't know how to do it. Their country failed in that. And so they're coming to a country that has been successful since the 1700s. And yet, they're trying to tell us what, how to do things. That doesn't work. Okay? So they should be quiet. Our Constitution, you know, as we said, was only made for moral and religious people. As people get further and further from God, then the country will only continue to decline. That's all we have. We're going to decline because people are getting further and further. We took the freedom of speech and we polluted it through lying or conniving or bribery. The Lord said He would protect those who are His. He said He would protect them from those who malign them. He would protect them from those with bad character and bad motives. He protected them. You know, I don't have time to discuss character here, but I do want to mention something. You know, the, the character is defined, okay? And, and the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to, to see if there's an attribute there that you might be weak like I am and, 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 and work on those. Character is defined, and I said it a couple of times already, but I love the quote of this guy, Bernard S. Kane. The total quality of a person's behavior as 
revealed in his habits of thoughts and expressions, interests and attitudes, actions, and the personal philosophy of life. We got all those things. Our thoughts. What is your mind occupied with? Is it good or are they evil? Are, are those thoughts good or are they evil? How do you express yourself when you disagree or agree? With something said or, you know, or done? Do you throw a fit or calmly deal with the situation? What is your attitude like? And how do you react to different situations? Do you go on the offense? Or you take the defense? Are you interested for the benefit of others? This is a big one. I think I'll do my next sermon on this one. Are you interested for the benefit of others or just looking out for yourself? Wow. That is something. Every action that you take, think about it. Are you doing it for your benefit of others or for your own interest? Solely for your own interest. Of course, we, we, we have some interest in it. We're doing it. But I'm talking about solely. I don't care if it benefits anybody else or not. That's the type we need to ask ourselves on. And lastly, how do you interpret life itself? Do you see it as good, bad, or indifferent? Do you go, do you go around asking God, why were the former days better than these? I used to ask myself, Oh, man, I remember the good old days. You know what? You know what God would say if you asked him that? Why were the former days better than this? You can go to Ecclesiastes 7, 10, and 11, and you'll find the answer. It says, For you you do not inquire wisely concerning this. It's not wise to ask God on this. Because God has not made it harder for you in this times than he's made it for others in other times. You know what's happened? Man has gotten worse. He's become worse, so he's made it bad for everyone. Worse and harder for us. Not God. God has nothing to do. He's always been God. He's always has the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know? If we find ourselves getting out of hand too often, we need to step back and let God take control of us. We need to. We need to stop thinking that we're in control, that we will be, we will triumph with our lips and look over what God has established. We need to acknowledge that God is who He is. He's our master and not us. We need to hide His word in our hearts so we might not sin against Him. We need to wake up every morning with Scripture ready at hand that we can use to help bring comfort to us as well as to others. We need to edify one another during our waking hours. This is what I use. These two scriptures, I wake up every morning and I say them. I memorize them and I put them in my heart. I want to live with that word. I want to hit that word in my heart so that I don't sin against God or others. It says, Proverbs 19, 14, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Colossians 4, 5 says, Walk in wisdom to those who are on outside, redeeming the time that my speech will always be with grace, even with salt, so that I may know how I ought to answer each one. God, we need those. You know, we need those before we go out. Because if we don't, if we don't have that Word of God in us, we're going to yell at whoever we talk to. We're going to get angry with people in the bank. We're going to get angry with people at the store because they're not fast enough or they're too fast and we didn't give them a chance to do something. I mean, it is always that way. If we're not prepared to meet the world, you know, in God's terms and God's ways, we're doing an injustice. You know, we need to, like it says, be acceptable in His sight. If it's acceptable in His sight, don't worry. You got it. It's God that we have to, have to be acceptable, not somebody else. 
I find it during the day. I find it uh, okay. And, and, and why? And why do I do that? Why? Why? Well, because they're God's words, right? And you know what? He said them, and he had them written down for a reason. So I take that as good advice, great advice, the best advice. You know. That's why I do it. I say them every morning, those two verses. At night I say two others, but this one's every morning. Because they're going to help me control my temper. Um, you know, uh, I have to learn every day. I like to control my temper. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, somebody says something and I'm going to, right away, I'm going to scream at him. No, I want to be able to hold back. And these two verses are in my heart. So they come at me all the time. And I says, I'm not going to say that. I mean, maybe I want to say that, but I'm not going to say it. You know? You know, our nation is becoming polluted. I've already mentioned it, but I'm just going to keep it a little more. We're almost, almost done. I'm at page 8 of page 20, but I'm almost done. <laughs> there could be little doubt in anyone's mind that this land of ours has become polluted. You know, the wicked really brought about when what is vile is honored among men. And that's why. I was noticing the other day, I don't recall where I saw it. I wish I, I could have took a little note. But I saw an actual recruitment, commercial or advertisement, I don't know by the United States Army. Excuse me, you say, to back up, United States Navy, sorry, sorry, sorry Army, okay, using no other than drag queens. Yes, extremely unpleasant to the sight and to God to promote young men and women to enlist in the Navy. Can you imagine using drag queens for that? I never thought it possible. Well, the day has come. It's almost, it seems almost unbelievable to, say, to, to, to see that it's taking place. Under President Obama, I saw this. I saw the United States Army. Okay, here, go, here you go, Army. Allowing for the officiating of a homosexual marriage ceremony officiated by none other than a now deceased U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Ginsburg. Ruth Ginsburg. At the United States Academy Chapel. Wow. That was unheard of. That was like, that will never happen. It happened. What is happening to our country? Why is it that suddenly we've gone from a country who honored God to a country where we are not proud to be promoting sexual perversion. I understand that this month, many are celebrating Pride Month, which is giving honor to the LGBTQ+, and so on. It makes absolutely no sense, other than nonsense, okay, that we as a country have set aside one day each, mind you, to celebrate and honor what our fallen heroes. We call it Memorial Day. We, we set aside one day to celebrate those who have served honorably or served in our military. We call it Veterans Day. But then we take and set aside one whole month to celebrate, to celebrate abomination in the eyes of God. One whole month. New York City and San Francisco have probably the largest gathering of participants for the Pride Celebration event. Do you know that New York City last year had an estimate 2.1 million participants? Just in New York City. I mean, that's just one city in the whole nation. Okay. San Francisco is estimated to have one million this year celebrating 
this abomination. It said, it's sad that Paimon has even included a commemoration, commemoration day of the African American culture and the emancipation of African American slaves. Thus, equating this, equating that LGBTQ crowd is uh, equating that with a race group as if they were fighting the same cause. You understand what I'm saying? The LGBTQ is piggybacking, piggybacking on the legit African American, you know, freedom of the emancipation of slaves. If I was an African American, I tell you what, I'd be on those people's back. How can they equate us? You know, being African descent is not a choice, my dear. But LGBTQ is. That's a choice. You can't help the color of your skin, but you can help the choice that you make. How dare they do that? The gall. Our younger generation is steadily being led down this path. Steadily being led down that same path. That's the way they're making them think in schools. And they're going to continue in colleges because of the presence of universities. That same type of ugly thinking. The abnormal has become the normal. And the normal, the abnormal. Let's see what God says on this one. Isaiah 5.20 Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Wow. You know, there's some people that are still stuck in the belief that we should let these sexual deviants do what they please because it's their right. You know, I can go along. It's their right. I might agree with that. But it's not their right to force a nation to buy into their immoral behavior. That is not their right. If they want to do something behind closed doors, in fact, that's how they got this little break. I'll do it behind my closed doors. I'm, man, if you're not abnormal now, you're not normal. If you're not a sexual demon, you're considered abnormal. There is no doubt that this country is going way south. No doubt in my mind. So much so that we are in jeopardy of losing the country for good. Are we going to stand quiet on this or are we going to let our voices be heard? We need to vote godly people in and sexually immoral people out. Man, I... I hate it when I see, they're always promoting first transgender, first transgender mayor of so-and-so, first transgender governor of so-and-so. Here's the first lesbian. Here's the first, you know, we have got people in powerful positions that are sexual deviants. And who's elected them? These are elected officials of powerful people. You know, God has given us, He's been good to us. He's been very good. He's given us, us what, we, what we are to expect in the latter times. And we need to prepare now for our entry into eternal life. Our missionary speaker said it. We need to prepare for our eternal life. The life here is temporary, but the one to come is indefinite. You know, as Jesus, I'm going to close out. As Jesus himself said, for what does it profit, for what profit is it to a man? He gains the whole world 
and he himself is destroyed for life. Wow. What does it take to get everything you want in this world? They're not taking anything. You came in naked, you're going to leave like that the same way. Let's pray. Father, help us, Lord, to be moral and rich of people, to be discerning right from wrong, good from evil, sweet from bitter, light from darkness, and direct, direct us in your path. Help us to pray for those that are lost in the hope that they too will turn from their wicked and vile ways to you, Lord, before it is too late for them. We live in a world which is fast forgetting your law. But help us retain that law in our hearts that we might not sin against you. We ask all this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.